Okay, well, I'm going to get started. Um, uh, this uh, uh, event is uh, being uh, videographed and will be on the Harvard website uh, eventually, or on some website eventually. Um, I'm uh, prepared to do two things. The first is the, uh, more, more extensive than the second, uh, and it is the discussion of the hot and cold uh, issue. Uh, and then second, uh, if there's time, uh, a much shorter uh, discussion of the, uh, leg the legislation and regulation component of the core. So the hot and cold stuff is applicable more or less generally across the first year curriculum. The second part is specific to the legislation and re regulation course. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me begin by offering a sort of general description of the issue of uh, hot and cold uh, cases. Uh, and then I'll turn to the way that that manifests itself in the uh, teaching materials for the legislation and regulation course. Um, the general idea of hot and cold cases is this. Uh, and I should say it's particularly important in uh, first year classes uh, if, if the message of what I'm about to describe gets across to students it becomes much less significant to try to do it uh, in uh, 2L and 3L classes, okay? So the hot case is one that uh, students entering law school um, will react strongly to, uh, either because the facts of the case appear to present a, uh, a, a, an outrageous uh, set of behavior by somebody uh, or because the decision strikes students, naive 1L students, as uh, manifestly unjust. Okay. Uh, the cold case is a case that uh, seems to 1L students incredibly dry and boring. Uh, why could anybody be interested in this uh, at all? Um, uh, the the uh, easier, the, the, the easiest um, um, example actually comes from not 1L cases, but from, in some ways, the entire curriculum in the federal courts course. Uh, where uh, the issues just seem dry as dust technical. Okay, so now what's the pedagogy associated with hot cases and cold cases? The uh, uh, idea uh, for the hot case is this. Um, the students come in with their you know, blood boiling, the, there's some outrage going on, and the teacher guides students through an analysis that shows why their initial reaction, their untutored pre-law school reaction, is um, unjustified. Uh, so uh, you think that, in particular, the, case, the case's outcome is, as I put it earlier, manifestly unjust. But when you look at both the relevant doctrine and the policy considerations that underlie that doctrine, you will see that this result, which again you thought initially was obviously unjust, actually makes sense. Indeed, is entirely defensible. Okay? Uh, so at the end of the story, you've got, uh, you start out, students start out uh, feeling that the legal system has produced injustice, uh, and at the end, uh, they uh, believe, uh, 
if the hot case pedagogy works the way it's supposed to work, that the legal system has actually vindicated justice properly understood. There's a footnote here. Uh, sometimes uh, at the, the next thing that happens by some instructors, but not by all, is to uh, point out what the course of thinking in the classroom has been from outrage to acceptance, and then to simply pose the question to students, is it possible to retrieve the sense of outrage after having gone through uh, this exercise? Um, that is, can you end up saying the from within the perspective that we have developed in this class, the result seems defensible, but it is nonetheless unjustified. Uh, that is, you can raise a question about whether the legal system produces uh, uh, justice, or whether there's an equation, an equation between what the legal system does and, and justice. Um, that, can, that can be done through in the uh, hot case pedagogy, but it isn't always done. Okay. So now turn to the cold cases. Uh, the cold case is the one that is highly technical and, and nobody could possibly care about it. Uh, no no uh, ordinary person would care about it. Um, uh, uh, as we'll see, the three major uh, uh, case books in legislation and regulation actually don't start with cold cases, so I don't have an easy example at hand. But again, the idea is that it's a highly technical case. And then the course of the discussion in class is one in which the instructor guides students to see how this apparently um, technical and boring case actually um, uh, brings, actually rests upon uh, the deepest kinds of philosophical considerations that one might uh, imagine. Uh, so uh, I'm, this is a hypothetical example. Uh, you can imagine the cold case being one in which two large corporations are fighting over the uh, interpretation of a contract provision uh, dealing with I don't know, the, the, the delivery of, um, uh, of goods that one of them regards as uh, unsatisfactory. And the instructor goes through the case and the problem to show that in order to resolve that, that this dispute properly, uh, you as students and the courts have to think about fundamental questions about what constitutes consent on the part of a person to a contract provision and what kinds of knowledge are necessary and so on. And these are, for the consent to be real, and these are very deep questions of uh, political, moral, ethical theory, uh, or legal theory. So the, put the hot cases and cold cases together and you see uh, a, a, a pedagogy in which the hot cases lead to a damping down of uh, uh, initial enthusiasm over the case, and the cold cases lead to a sort of ramping up of the student's uh, 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 attention or uh, um, investment in uh, the cases. <coughs> uh, on the cold case, incidentally, uh, the footnote here, is that um, thinking about most law students' future careers, they will mostly be dealing with cold cases, and so in this sense. Uh, and so uh, it's 
uh, valuable uh, in terms of, I don't know, uh, getting students into a mindset that will make their career choice comfortable for them, uh, to be able to put them in, in a position of saying, well, yes, I'll be dealing with these dry as dust cases, but deep down, all of these cases are about really fundamental issues of political and moral and ethical theory. Okay, so, so that's the general idea of hot and cold cases. Now let me um, illustrate them th with the three, uh, the, from three of the major course books, in, well, two of the major course books and mine uh, in legislation and regulation. Um, I, 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 when I started to prepare this exercise, uh, I uh, was surprised to discover that all three uh, begin with the hot case problem. Uh, uh, on reflection, I suppose that's not surprising. That is, the instructor is walking into a group of 1L students and uh, uh, wants to get them engaged immediately in the problem, uh, uh, and, and uh, beginning with a cold, dry as dust case uh, would not engage students. Uh, uh, so the choice of hot cases uh, makes sense. Uh, uh, the three case books are the Eskridge case book, uh, uh, the Man which uh, at the Manning, and call it the Yale version, the Manning and Stevenson case book, which is the one that's mostly used here, and then Heinzerling and Tushnet, which is what I teach from. Uh, what that means is that I am going to be talking about two, two cases, case books, uh, from which I haven't taught. And so I am imagining how the, um, the, the instruction goes. I can't, re I can't say this is actually what people do, when they teach the cases, uh, but I think it is from reading the materials overall uh, and trying to figure out how, if I were to teach them, uh, what would I uh, teach them. So let's see if I can do this. Okay, so this is from the Eskridge case book. I couldn't figure out how to get a decent uh, uh, um, screenshot uh, of this, but the Eskridge case book begins with the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, so a statute enacted by Congress obviously to promote racial justice. Um, and in terms of the thesis or the theme of this lecture series, um, it introduces issues of racial justice right up front. But how does it do that? Well, it does that through a case study of the interpretation of one aspect of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is the provision dealing with affirmative action. And there's a, I only did the first page, but the, the core of the case study, or of the presentation, is uh, the uh, Weber case, which is a challenge by a white employee to an affirmative action program adopted by uh, an employer. Uh, and the white employee relies on a provision of the Civil Rights Act that says, in shorthand, uh, this statute doesn't require the adoption of affirmative action programs. Okay, the issue in the case is whether the voluntary adoption of an affirmative action program in, uh, by the employer here uh, constitutes discrimination in employment on the basis of race. Okay. Uh, now, the presentation of the case uh, involves focusing on a particular statutory provision uh, and emphasizing a, a point I think 
well, a point taken by the dissent, uh, which is that the natural reading of this provision is that it, prohi- it, it prohibits race-based affirmative action, okay? Uh, so that uh, not, a, so, or, or, right, I think that's the best way to put it. The, the, the natural, the, the pedagogy is to say, the natural reading is that this provision prohibits race-based affirmative action. Um, therefore, because it's not authorized by the statute, the ordinary ban on race discrimination uh, comes into play, and the voluntary affirmative action program is unlawful under the statute. Um, And that's presented as the natural reading of the statute. Uh, A footnote here, I myself, I don't don't teach this case because I don't think that the statute in its natural reading actually says what the pedagogy associated with this uh, presentation uh, uh, asserts that it does. I don't want to get into the details here, uh, but the shorthand is that I think the best reading is that it says nobody is required by this statute to adopt an affirmative action program, which is different from saying you can't adopt an affirmative action program. Okay, so having said that, the again, the presentation of the statute is Uh, Here we have text that says what the employer did here constitutes affirmative action, constitutes racial discrimination. That's step one. Step two is to say, but if we look at the policies underlying the statute, those policies are aimed at promoting greater racial opportunity in employment and affirmative action program, voluntary affirmative action programs promote racial opportunity employment. And so now we've set it up so that there is a tension between what everybody will call a textualist analysis and a purposivist analysis. Uh, and then the instructor can go, in some ways, wherever he or she wants. Um, the... the, the um, Uh, the message that there is a conflict between the text and the purpose is the important point. Uh, And the reason it's important is that that conflict is what, or maybe is the first step in uh, treating uh, the case, or sorry, in shifting the case from the hot case category into the cold case category. Instead of having a visceral reaction to, uh, uh, to uh, the problem presented, um, I'll come back to a footnote on this in just a moment, instead of having a visceral reaction to it, you now see it as a technical problem of figuring out what should be done when there is a conflict between a statute's text text and its apparent purpose. And then you get into all sorts of things about uh, statutory interpretation. This is just the first case in the materials. Okay. The, the uh, footnote that I wanted to come back to is, I said you have a visceral reaction. You, meaning students, have a visceral reaction. Um, What's interesting about the case, and I think what makes it effective for the make a hot case, cold case, in, into a cold case uh, technique, is that the visceral reactions can be completely polarized. That is, uh, just to be crude about it, white students in the course may see the case as an outrageous example of racial discrimination on, the, on behalf of whites, uh, on uh, racial discrimination against whites. Um, not all, of course, I, and, and I'm overstating the, the, the polarization by placing it in uh, racial terms, uh, but uh, some students will see affirmative action uh, as uh, uh, outrageous. Uh, other students, 
roughly minority students will see uh, affirmative action as uh, a, an entirely just, indeed, uh, entirely just policy, indeed one that ought to be required uh, of, of employers. Although this is a voluntary uh, uh, program, uh, the visceral reaction on, on that side is, well, of course they're doing it because it's the right thing to do. <clears throat> and so the technique of converting this problem from one as, that you have a visceral reaction to into a cold technical case will work for every student in the class. Okay, so that's the that's this is the Eskridge uh, uh, approach. Um, the the next one is Manning and Stevenson. This is harder to see, but it it begins with the uh, snail darter case, uh, TVA against Hill, which involved the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and here the pedagogy is so the the ho the hot case dimension of this is the assumption, probably correct, that one uh, L students are um, more or less uh, imbued with envir pro-environmental consciousness. And so the Endangered Species Act comes with a uh, moral oomph behind it. It's a good statute. Um, then you have the, the, the then, then in the presentation of the, uh, of the snail darter case, for those who aren't familiar with it, the snail darter case is one in which uh, the, uh, the underlying facts are that the Tennessee Valley Authority is proposing to build a large dam uh, uh, which would flood an area uh, the dam would provide some power and some uh, recreational opportunities for people you know, to visit. Uh, the TVA is not, just, not only a power generating operation, it's also an economic development operation. And so doing the, creating the recreational area is something that TVA is interested in doing. Um, but when they flood the area, uh, they are going to eliminate the streams in which this uh, endangered species, the sm snail darter, darter uh, resides. So the Endangered Species Act says basically you can't, federal agencies can't engage in projects that would eliminate the habitats of endangered species. Okay, so the... Um, the lawsuit is a challenge to the TVA's program. Uh, um, the, so the first thing to do in setting the problem up is to observe that the snail darter is this, you know, who, uh, who one might care about many uh, uh, endangered species uh, one might, uh, the charismatic ones are the ones everybody focuses on, but one might even care about obscure species on the ground that maybe someday their uh, uh, preservation and production will generate uh, you know, valuable medical uh, uh, material for human beings. But who could care about the snail larder? And, um, uh, uh, and here's this, major economic development project that is being blocked by the Endangered Species Act's uh, uh, protection of, of the snail darter. Okay, so that's, you know, the first thing that the instructor is going to do is to say, this is a conflict between economic development and this trivial little fish, uh, uh, who, very hard to get worked up about, qua fish. Um, then the opinion, then you look at the opinion, and it offers what uh, uh, the instructor will say is a wooden textualist account. It says the obvious meaning, the only possible meaning of the words in the statute, uh, 
is that the people seeking the injunction on behalf of the snail daughter are entitled to enjoin the operation, the construction of this dam. Sure, it looks silly, but that's what textualist, uh, a textualist analysis uh, uh, requires. Um, now, and, and, and then there's a dissent that, that says there's another way of looking at this problem. The text isn't quite as clear, or there are alternative texts that you can draw on to say, no, uh, you don't have to enjoin the construction of the, of, of the dam. Uh, again, at this point, the instructor has two paths to follow. One is to say, um, well, textualism is the best way to interpret statutes. And if the statute says what it appears to the majority plainly to say, then what's going on is the court implementing a decision that Congress, that Congress has made. Don't blame textualism in the courts. If you think it's a silly result, blame Congress. Oh. Or uh, you can say, uh, well, this is just wooden textualism. Uh, is there an alternative? And then you start introducing the ideas of purposivism that I said would be introduced in the discussion of the Weber case in the Eskridge case book. Um, uh, okay, so again, you've begun to do the dampening down of the hotness of the case. What next happens is that you tell the story, you continue with the story, which is that uh, in response to the decision, uh, uh, Congress enacted a statute that says uh, we'll uh, when this kind of problem arises, uh, the, I think it's the Secretary of the Interior would convene what is conventionally called a God Squad. Uh, and the God Squad's charge will be determine whether the elimination of the species habitat uh, is, uh, uh, is, I'll say, just justified in light of the benefits associated with the uh, project, the, in this instance, the dam. Okay, so then the God Squad convenes, and it concludes that the TVA has massively overestimated the economic development benefits of the dam, and therefore the elimination of the habitat is not justified. Uh, at which point, Senators from, I think it's Tennessee, but senators from the area affected uh, insist on the inclusion of a specific provision in an Appropriations Act, uh, a budget, saying that this dam should be built, requiring that the dam be built. Okay, so the story is again, court says statute prohibits the TVA from going forward, uh, Congress eventually says we are going. We are going to require that it go forward, uh, and then the. I actually don't know how often the re the last line of the story is told, but the last line of the story is that the um, environmentalists uh, um, gathered a number of snail darters from the area where the dam was going to be built. Uh, and relocated them to another stream somewhere else in Tennessee or Kentucky. And it turned out that they were, the snail darters were just fine in the new stream. So the end of the story is, yes, you get this dam and you get the snail darters. Um, that's sort of, in one sense, a happy story, uh, wooden textualism, ends up with uh, satisfying both sides. Uh, uh, or one, and I think that's probably the, the main message given. Um, the, or you can say, uh, gee, isn't this a story about how farcical the process of statutory, uh, legislative enactment, statutory interpretation, and 
revision and so on, how farcical that is. We went all through, we went through all of this stuff, and in the end, um, it could have been, we could have started out by relocating the snail daughters and not done any of this. Um, I, okay. Uh, I think the farcical nature, farcical point is is rarely made because the aim is to set, tell students and induce students to think that overall the system works pretty well. Dam plus snail daughters. Um, okay. Then finally, there's the uh, Heinzerling and Tushnet, and, and uh, I, this one I can tell you how I teach it. Farwell is a case from the 1840s. Uh, uh, involving a railroad accident. Uh, a, a railroad worker is uh, injured when a rail, rail, or, or, when a rail car um, derails. Um, it, it's not a major, can't, can't be a major derailment or a major, because the injury is not a major injury. Uh, but he, he is injured. And the, seeks compensation from the employer, uh, the railroad, his employer, the railroad, and the court says, no, you can't get it because of what gets known as the fellow servant rule. Uh, the, the cause of the injury was negligence by a co-employee of yours. Uh, and uh, again, start out t bad injury uh, and then s result no recovery and then I work through the opinion, which is, in my view, a, a brilliant opinion, uh, uh, to, to explain why the denial of recovery makes sense. Um, roughly speaking, the argument that the court develops is that workers can demand higher wages from their employers for risks that are uh, caused by their co-workers, there are obvious objections that students raise to that. Those, those objections are actually addressed in the court's opinion. And so doing a careful reading of the opinion, uh, you end up saying, OK, this outcome is uh, OK. Uh, the worker is actually being paid through the higher wages for the injury. Uh, I can could go through in more detail how that works out, but the basic story is, is that. Um, so again, now this is a minor injury and nobody is terribly uh, excited about Farwell as a case in itself, partly because it's 1840 and people think, well, maybe the world, the legal world has changed. Uh, and so we juxtapose this to uh, uh, the way I teach it is, we start out with Farwell, and then we juxtapose it to a case of a really awful uh, uh, um, workplace injury uh, in the 1980s or 1990s. Um, a, a kid, a uh, 19, 20-year-old, uh, is killed in the collapse of a trench box, uh, uh, work, an excavation uh, uh, that he's working on because the employer didn't provide what the Occupational Safety and Health Administration says is a required set of protections. And then the pedagogy is to say, well, look, you ended up thinking in Farwell that everything was fine. Uh, why not think that what happened in the, it's the case of Patrick Walters, why not end up thinking that that was fine too? Uh, and it, it turns out, so when I teach it, I actually do the, you know, you, the, the, the routine of saying, well, you know, you really can't distinguish between uh, um, Farwell and Patrick Walters. Uh, the analytic moves that we made that made you happy or accept the result of Farwell are, you can make the same moves with, with respect to Patrick Walters. And then my point is, and I, this is not a, a widely uh, adopted casebook, so I can't say how other people teach it, but uh, my point is uh, then that that shows that there can be a disjuncture between what the law says, or what you think the law says, and what you think justice requires. Okay, so 
Now, uh, so now I've gone through how these issues are, uh, these are issues of uh, diversity in the affirmative action case and social justice in the workplace injury cases. Uh, I've gone through them, uh, gone through these case books, initial presentations <coughs> to show that both that they implicate the pedagogy of hot cases, hot cases, um, uh, and how that pedagogic, pedagogy is actually played out. Um, the message of the pedagogy is basically things are okay. Uh, you might think that some things are bad, that the legal system isn't working well, but when you really think hard about things or think like a lawyer about the problems, you will see that what's happening makes sense in a way that you should be satisfied with. That's the ideological message of uh, the hot case, cold case methodology. I, it, it turns out, and I, as I, say, I said, I now understand it, that the initial presentation in these materials, in the legislation and regulation materials, is not, um, doesn't use a cold case methodology. Um, I've had conversations with people who say, you know, it's really useful to begin um, uh, uh, the section on statutory interpretation with a, um, a cold case uh, uh, um, because you can immediately get to the technical things that you want to uh, uh, get at. Uh, in, in, this is, this is, in, in the Heinrich and Touchnet book, uh, we begin with Farwell because of a strategy we have for the book. And then when we get to this section that's explicitly about, um, about uh, 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 um, statutory interpretation, we begin with a much colder case, the Yates case, which involves the um, taking of oversized red snapper. Uh, and there, uh, some people, many people actually think that the re result is also outrageous uh, uh, because the, con the legal viol the, the statutory violation, if there is one, seems incredibly trivial, and the punishment seems much larger than it should be. Uh, but even if you don't see it that way, uh, uh, the case is colder, or if you see it, even if you see it that way, right, uh, the case is colder than uh, Farwell and the Patrick Walters case. Okay, I think we're going to stop because uh, we have to get out of here eventually. In there, uh, but if there are any questions or observations, uh, I'd be happy to address them. I, I will give you uh, the uh, microphone if if you want, uh, uh, although it's uh, small enough that probably can just talk loudly. Is there anything? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering. So it sounds like implicitly in what you're saying, there's a critique of the hot and cold case approach to, to teaching, and particularly what you said about the idea that it's meant to kind of, uh, I don't know, if make students more amenable to the the careers that we anticipate they will have in law. And uh, what is the is there an alternative to this? Is there a sort of against the hot and cold case method that you've observed in in these classes? Uh, so that, that's a really, uh, it's really an interesting question. Um, uh, I think that the um, stuff that's done along the way in both the hot case and the cold case is actually pedagogically valuable in providing students with a things that should go into their tool toolkit, uh, no matter what their jobs are going to be. Okay, so I don't think that the uh, things, the components of the process are problematic. 
The concern is the, what I call, just call the ideological implications at the end of the process. So then the question is, well, if you recognize those ideological implications, what do you do? Uh, and um, it's, you know, I, I think the, the, um, the uh, my preferred, I'll, I'll, I'll offer two. One is, uh, the one that I prefer, which is to say more or less explicitly that we've gone through all this stuff. At the end, your uh, outrage juices have been leached out of you. Uh, um, go back and put them back in. Your initial reaction to the case was correct. It is an outrage. Uh, and now you can think about whether you know, the legal system that supports this outrage is a good thing, and you know, the implication is no, it isn't. Uh, uh, another technique that I have, uh, I, when I was a law student, I saw done quite effectively was, uh, uh, this is done by uh, Art Leff at, at Yale Law School, uh, in a course that was uh, designated, I think it was called Consumer Protection Law. Um, uh, what he did sort of on a more or less daily basis uh, was to examine particular doctrines uh, from a highly legalist, legal realist inflected uh, point of view uh, with the effect of communicating as I, I think, I don't remember whether it's me who came up with this description or other people and I just appropriated it. It was like what he was doing with each doctrine was holding up a dead rat in front of the class and saying, this is what the law is. So it was, you know, you got what the law was accompanied by a more or less, well, uh, a, a, an implicit but quite clear message that there was nothing attractive about it whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so my the way I see, or when I was taking my work, the what I perceived the professor to be kind of doing, and also the textbook to be kind of doing, is especially. And I think that's really clear with the Manning Stevenson example you have with TVOB Hill was to kind of show that like uh, like your uh, like different, I guess like legal methodologies might not correlate with the substantive outcome you want and it seems as though they're really trying to knock out of students um, like an urge to like be attached to the substantive outcome that something produces and I like I think that like I thought maybe that was kind of reasonable because students because maybe they think that students when they come into law school are overly attached to caring just about what the law delivers in terms of substantive outcomes. And so when you're teaching, do you think that students are too much that way and they need to be corrected? Or is that like not an accurate presumption? Yeah, so uh, I, that, that's also an extremely interesting observation. Uh, it sounds, I mean, it, it resonates. So it's, you know, um, uh, I don't think that about students. My, this is, uh, you know, people come in thinking what they do. My view is I, it's not my job to change their thinking about uh, substantive issues. You know, uh, the, as, as I say this semi-jokingly in the class, but it's only semi-joking. We have a lot of environmental cases, and a lot of students care about the environment. I don't care about the environment. Uh, uh, I teach the cases, but, you know, um, they're, they're just, for me, cases about a subject matter. Uh, if you care about the outcome, that's fine with me. If you don't care, if you're like me, you don't care, fine. Um, uh, I, I would say that the, again, the, there's, not, there's an, call it a quasi-professionalism uh, interest, which I would also describe as a quasi-ideological interest in the process you're describing because you, many students, 
will find themselves pursuing careers that at some point require them to take positions that are inconsistent with their antecedent substantive preferences. Uh, and, you know, if, all, you know, if everything goes well, that won't happen very often. Uh, you can choose career paths that predictably won't have that effect, but for many students, that will happen. And so um, weakening the tie between your substantive views and what you do in your professional capacity may have this quasi-professional benefit. Um, now, again, sort of my take on that phenomenon would be to, uh, I, if I were doing things in that way, and I, you know, having said this, it might be worth me introducing this explicitly into the class next time I teach it, uh, would be to say, when you find yourself in that position, um, one thing that you should think about is whether you should do something else. That is, find another job where this conflict will occur less, less often. Or uh, find a job where you expect that it won't occur at all. Um, um, okay, so I think that's, you know, I, I, I guess, I, I, we do have to stop now, but uh, I, I guess I want to uh, emphasize that in some ways the point of this lecture is to stress my view that, <laughs> just to give, with respect to issues of diversity and social justice in the first year classes, there is always an ideological component. Uh, sometimes, indeed most often, it, it, the, 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 the most interesting ideological elements are concealed. It's not like the course in legislation and regulation is, oh, the administrative state's a good thing. Um, the ideological message is in this version about professionalism, what it means to be a lawyer. It means to damp down your substantive commitments in the service of your professionalism. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, um, I've never done this before, and I found it quite interesting. So, yeah, okay. <laughs>